Hey folks, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, just waiting for a couple of minutes for, the, for others to join. I hope I'm audible. Uh, just let me know in the chat section if, if I'm not audible or if there is any hiccup. Uh, please try to join these live sessions on a broadband connection. Try to avoid a 3G or 4G because you'll notice significant latencies and significant delay if you watch it on 3G or 4G, unless you have a terrific 3G, 4G connection. So I'm just I'm just uh, checking out if everything is going okay. Okay, so everything seems to be okay. Uh, just let me refresh it. Okay, no issues here. Uh, okay. Okay, so yeah, few people have joined in. Hey folks, uh, let's wait for a couple of minutes. Uh, just give me a sec. Okay, let's wait for a couple of minutes here uh, as. Okay, just checking it here. Okay, so I think things are good. Uh, let's let's wait for a couple of minutes, uh, maybe seven four or so. It's seven two p.m. India time. Uh, yeah. So anything that you have, you can just post it in the in the chat section. I'll try to cover them. Uh, uh, I'll try to cover them by the end of the session. Of course, we have some problems that we'll go through, obviously. So, uh, OK, uh, as, as we wait for others to join, so what we have done is this. To all of our registered students, along with the course content, we have given them practice problems. What we will try and do in these live sessions, which we conduct twice a week, we will try and solve these practice problems first, Okay, especially the harder ones, the tricky ones, so that, again, when you are solving these, we avoid giving you the answers because we want you to struggle and build that capability to solve these problems, right? To solve these problems, which are at gate level or so. Now, during these live sessions, we'll solve each of these problems so that you understand how to solve it in detail. And if you have solved it, that's very good. In addition to that, if there is anything in general that we want to discuss or announce or a general discussion or anything like that, we'll try to keep some time aside for that also, okay? So let's get started. I'll, I'll start sharing my screen now. Uh, since we're already seven, three minutes in, let me start sharing my screen here. Uh, OK. Moving to my screen share here, as all of you can see. Uh, OK. Uh, OK, folks. Uh, somebody was asking about practice test. Uh, so what we're doing with these practice sets, tests is uh, for every three days worth of content, we are giving you practice problems, right? The hope is by the end of the whole live session or by the end of the course, you should solve a few thousand problems, right? But hopefully all the problems on your own, okay? Because that's the best way for you to learn. So these are like, okay, suppose you, you see some content, you have some solved problems and then, okay, so let me show you this, okay? Let me walk you through the course, right? So this is for registered students only, obviously. There are some sample videos for everyone to check out. So we started off data structures and algorithms this week. Uh, these are some of the basic content. We asked all of our registered students to finish up to lecture 5.5, right? So in this, we have learned about uh, why learn data structures algorithms? Why should we bother about sorting and searching? Uh, basics of insertion sort, proving that insertion sort actually works some properties of insertion sort, pseudocode, all of that stuff. Also, how to analyze, very simple intuitive explanation of how to analyze an algorithm here. And then we introduced some basics of big O, theta, and omega notation, right? Some basic notations, OK? Of course, so as you notice, our students have only covered till 5.5 .5 right till now. But if you see 5.6, if you see chapter 6, chapter 6 is all of gate solved problems. Right? These are about eight solved problems that we have, which are related to uh, big O, theta, the asymptotic analysis, right? or the notations, the asymptotic notations. So after this, we give you a bunch of problems. Similarly for merge sort, you see a bunch of, uh, you see a bunch of theory content about what merge sort is, why does it work, why is it useful, and all of those things. And again, we have a bunch of solved problems. Okay? These are problems that we solve to help you understand. So uh, the first set of problems that we've given to our students is here. Okay, this is practice test one. It covers some of insertion sort and some of asymptotic analysis, right? 
So now uh, let me just, OK, this is the actual interface that you'll encounter. So all the registered students actually encounter this interface. So this interface is very similar to how the gate interface is. We want you to get acquainted with, with how actually it works, how gate interface works. So this is something that we have built for our mock tests last year. And we're using the same thing for practice sessions also so that you understand and you're ready from day one for the actual gate exam, right? So let's go through each of these problems and solve them. There are some problems. There are some practice problems that we gave. There are some practice problems. I'll make a note of them. There are some practice problems that we gave for this session, which are slightly on the harder side of things. What I mean by that is, OK, let, let me explain you what I mean by that. OK, so what I mean by that is, uh, OK, OK, let's go to the curriculum here. OK, sorry, let's go to the curriculum here. OK, so our students have solved till 5.5 now. Our students have solved till 5.5. If they would have covered 5.6, 5.7, and if they would have covered chapter six, right? Chapter six is very important because here are a lot of old problems in gate that we have actually solved to help you understand how to solve problems. If they've covered till 6.8, they could have easily solved all the 15 practice problems that we gave them for these three days, right? But uh, since this couldn't be covered uh, because we didn't want to push students right away in the very first week, obviously, as time progresses, we'll give you more and more content to finish on a regular basis. So some of these questions in the practice test that we have given, I think five, six questions, we will postpone them till the time students finish chapter six also so that they can better solve these problems. Right. So going back to the, the testing interface that we have here, so this problem is straightforward. Let's let's start solving these problems. Okay, let's look at the question here. Okay, so let's look at the question here. Okay, let me change the colors here. Okay, so it says uh, consider an array. Uh, given this array, this array has how many elements? Six elements. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six elements. You have 31, 41, 59, 26, 41, and 58. Right? These are the six elements that you have. What are the number of iterations required to sort the elements in the given array using insertion sort? Because we've already learned insertion sort, right? This is very, very straightforward, right? In insertion sort, the first element is by default sorted. You take this element, you compare with this element, right? This element is greater. So in the first iteration, in the first iteration, you're comparing this element with, you're comparing the second element with the first element. Since this is already greater, Right? There is no swapping needed. So at the end of first iteration, you have the same thing. Next, in the second iteration, what happens? You compare this element with the previous element. This element is already greater. Right? By the time you come to second iteration, this whole subarray is already sorted, as we discussed in the course videos. Right? So 59 is anyway greater than 41, nothing to be swapped. Right? So this is also sorted by the, by the time of your second iteration. What happens in your third iteration? You're 26. Right? Now if you compare your 26 with 59, right? So look at this, your 29 with 50, 26 with 59. 26 is less than 59, which means you'll push your 59 to the right, as we discussed in the course videos, right? You'll, you'll store this 26 in a temp variable. You'll push this 59 to the right. Now you compare this 26 with 41. 26 is smaller than 41, so you push 41 also to the right. We call it move to the right, right, in the course videos. Similarly, you take 26, compare with 31. You'll move 31 also to the right. And finally, at the end of at the end of third iteration, you will have 26, 31, 41, 59, 41, and 58. This is how the array looks like at the end of third iteration, right? And all these arrays are already sorted. The subarray is already sorted at the end of third iteration. Now let's go to the fourth iteration. In the fourth iteration, what would happen? This would be compared with this. Since this is greater, it would move to the right. Now, it will compare with this, right? Now, look at this. Since 41 is same as 41, you don't have to move 41, right? So, because we also want this to be stable sort, right? So, you have 36, so 26, 31, 41, 41, 59, and 58. This is what you had at the end of fifth iteration. Now, this whole thing is already sorted, right? Now, at the, now you have the fifth iteration. In the fifth iteration, what would you do? You would compare this element with this. Since this is greater, you would move it to the right. And finally, you will get 26, 31, 41, 41, 58, and 59. 
how many iterations did you perform three iterations here fourth iteration here and fifth iteration here so the right answer here is five of course you might wonder that i've taken so much time here i'm only trying to explain it to you if we were to solve this in an examination setting you can actually solve this problem in under 30 seconds right i'm only trying to explain it to you clearly here if this problem were to be solved in an examination setting we can actually solve it in under 30 seconds you'll just say okay first the first iteration will run with 41 the second iteration will run with 59 third iteration fourth iteration fifth iteration so there's six elements and there are five iterations problem solved right i hope this is clear right so very simple problem if you know how insertion sort works if you understand the basics of insertion sort you can trivially solve this problem nothing fancy and nothing hard here okay so this is your first question now let's go to the second question right okay this is also an interesting question i think there is a small typo here okay so okay i'll explain you the typo forget about the options the way i always solve problems is i first read the problem i try to solve it and then find the right option here of course sometimes you can solve by elimination also we'll come to that okay so let's look at this five four three two one what are the steps of what all steps happen right when you're performing insertion sort on this right so you have basically the array that you have here is exactly in the it, it's in descending order right while the default order of any sorting algorithm is ascending order right now what happens in this right let's look it up okay in the first iteration what happens this is assumed to be trivially sorted you start with this element you compare this element with this element since four is less than five you swap or in other words you move five to the right so the, in the first iteration what do you get you get this four five three two one right which means okay which means this option cannot be right right four five three two one four five two three five okay it should be four five three two one right it can't be four four three two one five this also cannot be right right in the first iteration at the end of first iteration you should have four five three two one so either this or this either this option or this option can be right right now now let's look at the next iteration so now this array is already sorted now you take the next item which is three now you compare three with five three is less than five so five moves to the right three is less than four so four moves to the right so what would you get now three four five two one right this is and this part is already sorted this is what you would get now right so now if you notice okay if you notice here it's saying two three four five one no it has to be three five three four five two one right so this is the first iteration this is the second iteration the third iteration and the fourth iteration so of course you can also eliminate this option the right option is this right very simple okay again by eliminating by eliminating options you can speed up your uh, solution or you can speed up coming up with the solution because now i don't i have run basically first iteration and second iteration i don't have to run third and fourth iteration because there is only one option which satisfies what we have till now right so you can do solve this problem very very quickly i hope all of this is clear till now okay sounds good okay so let's go to the third problem anyway before i go to the third problem let's go and uh, check out the chat section and see if there are any questions regarding these two questions right so okay nothing major here so i'll just continue here as one of my colleagues just told me that nothing major there i can just jump to third question so Navin, do let me know if there is a question that you want me to answer okay so that i don't have to keep swapping the pages okay okay the next question what which of the following is the tightest upper bound that represents the number of swaps required to sort n numbers using insertion sort remember the question you have to read very carefully the question is not saying number of comparisons it is saying number of swaps is what it is saying right it wants a tight upper bound on the number of swaps to sort and to sort n uh, items using insertion sort so we know that insertion sort's worst case is when the algorithm is already in descending order we want the sorting to be to result in ascending order but if it is in descending order like this that would result in the maximum number of swaps let's see okay let me justify that to you so first item trivially sorted second item right this item has to be compared with this item and this item moves to the right swap basically in this case is basically moving this to the right 
That's what is a swap in the case of an insertion sort. Basically, moving this to the right is also called a swap, right? In this case. Now, for this for the second element, this is my first element, my second element, my third element, my fourth element, my fifth element. So, first element, there is nothing. For my second element, how many move to the rights or swaps have I done? I've done only one, right? So, what will this result in? It will result in four, five, three, two, one. Okay, this is now sorted. Now I'll start with three. Now, when I compare three with five, five has to move to the right. Again, when I compare three with four, four has to move to the right. So when I when I move third item, there are two swaps, right? When I compare my fourth item, there will be three swaps. When I compare my fifth item, there will be four swaps. When I compare my nth item, imagine this array was of size n, I would have n minus one swaps or moves to the right. We have done this analysis, by the way. We have already done this analysis in the course videos. Now, if I sum up all of them, if I sum up all of them, what do I get? I get one plus, two plus, so on, so forth, n minus one. This is simple arithmetic progression, right? What is the sum of the first n minus one numbers? It is n minus one into n by two, right? Which is nothing but, which is order of n square. We have already seen this. We have already seen that this is order of n square. Right? So the maximum number or the tightest upper bound on the number of swaps using insertion sort is order of n square. Very simple, straightforward question. Actually, you don't even have to do all of this. You don't even have to do all of this because we already learned this in the course videos. We, we computed how many comparisons happen, how many swaps happen and all of that. Right? In the future, we will learn a different algorithm called selection sort. Okay, when it comes to selection sort, I'll explain you there. Selection sort has this nice feature that we don't require order of n square swaps. We can actually get away with order of n swaps. And we'll, when we learn selection sort, we'll understand this better on why swaps are important. Okay, right now I don't want to go into it because we have not yet discussed selection sort. Okay. Okay, very good question. So uh, the question from one of our students is tightest upper bound versus upper bound, right? So in asymptotic analysis, we saw that if something is from the definition of asymptotic analysis, look at this. So this is also, so anything which is order of big O of n square, okay, is also big O of n cube. Look at this from the plot, right? From the plot of big O notation, imagine if this is my function, right? This is my f of n, let's say, okay, this is my n. If g of n, let's say this is my g of n, okay, beyond a value of n naught, my c into g of n, okay, is greater than or equal to f of n. This is the definition of big O. Now, if this is g of n, and let's assume I have another function, which is h of n, okay, some c dash into h of n. Now, if h of n grows faster than g of n, remember your order of n cube, as n increases, as n increases, n square increases faster than n. Similarly, n cube also increases faster than n square itself. So if you have a function, if you have your asymptotic analysis, if your function, if your f of n is order of n square, you can say it is also order of n cube. It is order of every function which grows faster than n square also. Here the interesting part is the tightest upper bound, which means you want to pick the one which is, which is, very, which is very close to f of n here, geometrically speaking. Or in other words, you don't want to pick n cube. Right? In this case, anyway, there is no confusion here because something which is big O of n square, right, is not big O of n log n. Again, some of this may not have been covered till now in the course videos that you have seen, but please bear with me. You'll be able to understand this better as you progress through the course. Right? You may not be able to grasp this completely right now. Okay? But slowly you'll get to that. Okay? As I told you, in the next few videos where we solve a lot of, lot of previous gate questions and previous problems, interesting problems, this will become much more, uh, much more clear to you. But that's a very good question. What is the difference between tightest upper bound and an upper bound? In this case, since you have order of n square and all of these grow slower than order of n square. Again, there is this video of 5.6. I think that video is 5.6, right? So let me show you that video, okay? In the course videos, Right, so I think all of our students have done up to 5.5 right now. Actually, there is this video called 5.6, which teaches you about the order of common functions. 
Okay, given these functions like order of n square, order of log n, right? Given these functions, okay, given n square, log n, n log n, it tells you what is the order amongst these functions. Okay, that's the very next video that we haven't covered till now. Okay, so this week or before Saturday, we will ask you to cover this. So these concepts will become clearer as we go, as as we as we progress through it. Okay, okay. So let's let's go here. Okay, this is clear. Order of n square is the answer here. Nothing very fancy or hard here. Okay, so this is third question. Let's go to the fourth question. Okay, so this question I'll hold. Okay, we will skip this question because to solve this question, right? To solve this question, you need to understand the order of functions. Okay, to solve this question better, you need to understand the order of functions, which is the which is video number which is lecture number five point six. The very next video where we where we stopped this where we stopped for this right we stopped at 5.5 for all of our registered students we asked them to go through in 5.5 right 5.6 video if you had gone through it's actually we should have thought about it more carefully when we gave these problems we'll we'll correct ourselves but if you had gone through 5.6 and solved some of these problems okay we want you to see how we solve the problems so that you can you can learn it and of course solve these problems so my suggestion is uh, by Saturday, when we have the next live session, we will ask you to cover some more problems that we have solved and some more concepts. And then you'll be able to solve this very easily. Trust me. And we will move this problem to the next practice session. Right? We'll move this problem to the next practice section. Practice session. OK? So OK, sounds good. So I'll skip a few problems like this, as I told you earlier. OK? So the next problem. OK, this is an interesting problem. Let me just get a gulp of water first. OK, so look at this code segment here. You have i equals to 1, i less than equal to n, i plus plus, right? So what will happen here? i will be 1, then i will be 2. OK, let's start with i equals to 1, right? i will go from 1 to n, and i is being incremented by 1. Look at within this i loop. So this is C code, right? Within this for loop, there is j loop, right? So you have j equals to 1. So when i is equal to 1, what happens? Your j is equal to 1, right? Then what happens to your j next? Look at this. How is j incremented? OK, j will be initially 1. And you're printing something. You're printing some high here, OK, within the for loop of j. So this is the outer loop. This is the inner loop. And you have the print high, OK? Uh, so, OK, j will be 1. OK, then j will be incremented by i. Because i is 1, your next j, first value of j is 1. Then the next value of j will be 2. Then the next value of j will be 3. Because look at this, j equals to j plus i. And our i is 1. When we started this outer loop, your, our i is 1. So then j will be equal to 4, equal to 5, so on, so forth, up to j equals to n, right? Which means when this when i equals to one, this j loop with print high ran n times, right? How many times did it run? It ran n times. So your high would have been printed n times when i equals to one. Now let's see what happens when i equals to two. Okay, so this loop finished because i gets incremented by one. When i equals to two, what happens? My j will start at one. My j will one. I'll print high. Then j is incremented by i. So j is j plus i. That is the key part here. This is the key part here. You can't miss that. OK, so j will become now j plus i. It will become 3. Then it will become 5. Then it will become 7. Then it will become 9. So on, so forth, up to n. Right? How many values are here now? Look at this. So you have 1, 3, 5, 7. You have a gap of 2. Right? So these are odd numbers. Right? These are odd numbers that you have. So you have n by 2 times this loop would run. Right now, let's see what happens when i equals to three. Obviously, your j will start with one. Now, the next value of j will be four. Right? Then the next value of j will be seven because j equals to j plus i. Then ten. Then thirteen. So on, so forth, up to n. How many such numbers are there? Look at this. I'm adding three, three every time. So roughly, you'll have this loop would run roughly n by three times. Right. Similarly, when i equals to 4, what happens? Your j will be 1, then j will be 5, then j will be 9, so on, so forth, up to n. So how many times this would run? n by 4 times. So on, it will go on up to 1. 
So what is the total time complexity of this whole thing? It is the sum of all these values. It is the sum of all these values. What is the sum of all of those values? It is n plus n by 2 plus n by 3 plus n by 4, so on, so forth, up to 1. What is this equal to? This is equal to n. 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 4 plus up to 1. Now comes the fun part. All of your 11th and 12th class mathematics, okay, that you all might have forgotten, will come to bite you here. Trust me. Okay, you have your n here. This looks like something that you studied in your 11th and 12th class, right? This is actually called a harmonic series. This is actually called as a harmonic series. Okay, most of us would have forgotten it. So I'll take you to Wikipedia page for this, right? I'll take you to Wikipedia page for this. Just give me a sec. So my best source of knowledge obviously is Wikipedia. So I'm on Wikipedia page for harmonic series. Here, there is this nice function, there is this nice idea called the rate of divergence. It says, if you have this summation, okay, this is exactly what we have. We have one plus, one by two plus, one by three plus, up to one by k. So it shows that this sum is equal to log k, okay, plus some constant. Or in other words, this is less than or equal to log k plus one. This is the key insight to solve this problem. We intentionally gave you a problem which is slightly harder because we want you to struggle through it. And the moment you recognize that you have harmonic series, you should be able to Google search and find out. Of course, in, in the real gate exam, nobody will give you Google search, unfortunately. But now you learned, OK? Learning concepts, when you're stuck with a problem, will teach you forever that. Actually, I remember this log n or log k concept because I tried to solve this problem long ago and I got stuck. OK, so going back to our problem now, going back to our problem, going back to our problem now, let's go to the page here. So we had n into 1 plus 1 by 2 plus 1 by 3 plus up to 1 by n. This is what we had. And we know that this is order of log n. We know that this is order of log n. We just saw that, right? So now the total time complexity of this would be order of n into log n. The key concept here is, of course, you have to understand how this code is running and all that. But the other concept is that the sum of a harmonic series of numbers is order of log n. That's a key idea that we didn't teach, but we wanted you to figure it out on your own. OK, because once you learn it, when you struggle, you will never forget it in your life. Trust me. OK, so the right answer here is uh, this, right? Tn is uh, order of n log n. We intentionally gave you a few harder problems. OK, so next comes the sixth one. OK, we'll also leave this. OK, very good question. Very good question. So let me explain this to you. OK, so the question here is, is log n same as ln n? OK, so in logarithms, probably you learned this in your eighth or ninth classes, maybe 10th class. I don't remember when I learned it exactly. Log n in computer science basically means log n base 2. That's what log n typical. When, whenever we write LGN, we mean log n base 2. Ln n, ln n, right? In most of in most of mathematics and science, when we write this, what this means it is log n base e, right? E is the exponent of the natural logarithm, right? So these two are away by a constant factor. Because E is some 2.7 something, something, something. OK, so something which is order of log n is, is same as order of ln n. So don't worry about that. In most of computer science, especially in algorithmic analysis, we will encounter log n base 2s. We seldom encounter ln n's. OK, in physics, in physics, right, uh, and even in other areas of engineering like electronics electrical engineering you encounter natural logarithm a lot but a simple thing that you have to recognize is order of log n is same as order of log n actually you can say theta okay you can be you can give a very tight bound right they're effectively the same thing this is base 2 this is base e that's it okay very simple concept nothing hard that's a good question nonetheless okay so this question will hold out I'm glad Naveen is with me because he's reading through the comments and stopping me 
from progressing to the next course, uh, to the next question. We'll continue this model. I mean, I really like it that somebody is questioning well, if they don't understand if there is something that I skipped, like log n, log n, right? Because it's obvious for me, but may not be obvious for some of the students. So this question will hold. And as I told you, when you read about, when you understand the order of functions, when you understand the order of functions, you'll be able to solve these questions much better. We'll move this to the next practice, next practice session. Okay, this is also simple. So six questions done. Actually, we can solve all of these problems. Like, okay, this question also will hold. Sorry. Of course, there are some questions which I'll hold. We'll move it to the next section. When we actually made this practice session, we thought we'll cover up to 5.7. And hence, students should be able to solve this. But our apologies. We'll avoid these mistakes from next time. Okay, this will be moved to the next session again. Okay. And again, all these questions are randomized the way they would be in gate. Okay, let's go to this question. What is the worst case time complexity of insertion sort if the if all the elements in the list are in descending order? This is a straightforward problem. By the way, there are some gate problems which, which you can answer in like 10 seconds. Again, gate questions, you'll see all sorts of questions. You'll see really hard questions. You'll see medium level questions and you'll see easy questions. If you understand the concept, like this question is trivial. Okay, when, you, when your list is in descending order, you know it's the worst case of insertion sort, right? You know that the time complexity, okay? You, you anyway have order of n square comparisons and you have order of n square swaps, right? So which means the total time complexity is going to be order of n square. You don't even have to think about it. Of course, you have to read your question carefully and there will be tricky ones. Okay, let me tell you that also. Okay, so there will be hard questions. I remember, I think uh, some of, at least when I was preparing for GATE, I think 2003, 2006, I think 2011 also, right? What are the hardest question papers? Mm -hmm. Six is super hard. I know this because I wrote this exam. <laughs> I was in BTEC third year, I wrote 2006. It was a nightmare. 2003, I think also is a very hard paper because I remember it very vividly. Anyway, there are some medium questions and easy questions. There are some tricky questions where if you don't read it carefully, you'll make mistakes. So keep an eye out. Don't think every question is easy. Keep an eye for tricky questions also. Okay. Having said that, so let's move to the ninth question. Oh, this is a good question. I really like this. Okay. So let's look at it. Look it up, right? So your i is equal to 2. Okay. So how many times will the following loop run for a given value of n? Okay. Let's look it up. So your i is equal to 2 first. Okay. Then what happens to i next? i equals to 2. So when you here you don't have i equals to i plus 1. You have i equals to power of i comma 2, which means what this function does in C is it computes i power 2. This is what it does. So my i right term is 2. So 2 power 2 will be the next value of i. The next value of i is, so what is this? This is 4. Right? The next value of i would be 4 power 2, right? because i square, look, look at how i is getting incremented or how, is getting, how, how, how i changes with this loop, right? which is equal to 16. And what is 16? 16 is 2 power 2 power 2. This is 2 power 2 power 1. Okay, I can write this, right? Very simple. I can write this as 2 power 2 power 0 because 2 power 0 is 1. Okay, 2 power 1 is 2, 2 power 1 is 2, 2 power 2 is 4, 2 power 2 is 4, 2 power 4 is 16. Next, when i equals to, uh, in the next iteration, what happens? I would get 16 squared. What is 16 squared? 16 squared is 256, which is nothing but 2 power, 2 power 3. This will keep happening till the time, look at this, look at the termination condition, till the time i is less than or equal to n. Now, the question here is, how many times would this loop run? Right, that's a question. It will run till the time your n is less than or equal to this. So let's assume this loop runs some k times. Okay, let's assume the loop runs. Okay, let's look it up. Okay, so it will keep running this. Okay, at at some k, look at this. This is when the loop ran one time at the very beginning. The loop didn't run actually here. Okay, here the loop didn't even run. It got started. When the loop ran one time, this is what you have. When the loop ran two times, this is what this is the value of i. When the loop ran three times, this is what you have. 
when the loop run k times, what will be the value that you'll have for i? It will be 2 power 2 power k, right? When the loop runs k times, let's say assume when the loop runs k times, right? This condition is no more satisfied, which means your i is, let's say, greater than n. Then you'll come out of that loop, right? Right? At k iteration, let's assume you come out of the loop. Then I can write 2 power 2 power k to be equal to n when this when this happens right when 2 power 2 power k is actually greater than n when this is greater than n actually i'll come out of the loop but to solve this problem let's actually simplify it and write it because i only care about the theta notation look at it i only care about the big o notation right so one here and there will not hurt us okay let's write this and try to solve this now here is what we have okay let me write it down here carefully okay let me erase some of this okay because the logic is clear now okay if i erase this i can i can reuse this space instead of creating new space here okay so what we have to solve if the I, if the loop runs k times i need to find k such that 2 power 2 power k is roughly equal to n now take log on both sides okay take log base 2 so log base 2 okay which we write it as lg okay if i take log on both sides what do i get i get log n here what is log of this? What is log of log base 2 of 2 power x? By definition of logarithms, this is equal to x. By definition, this is the definition of logarithms. Right? This is a very, very simple concept in logarithms. Probably you learned it in your ninth or 10th class. Right? This is from the definition of logarithms. This is equal to x. So log of 2 power 2 power k is 2 power k. Basically, I took log on both sides. Now, again, I'll take log on both sides, okay, because I want to find k. So if I take log of this base 2, that will remain only k because of this formula. Now, this will become log of log n. That's what my k is. So this loop will run for order of log of log of n times. Again, don't worry about this. We will see many such complex uh, functions as we as we learn more and more in the order of functions in the order of functions and when we learn about recurrence relations the concepts in the next couple of chapters right you'll get very very acquainted you'll keep seeing this many times that this will feel like obvious it's obvious here okay so the three options that you're given is order of n order of log n order of n square none of them right the the actual answer is order of log log n right that's that's the right answer here so because we are given none of these as an option, we'll just use that option. Okay, I hope this is clear. All you needed to know, remember, to solve this problem, all you needed to know was the concept of logarithms that you probably learned in your ninth or 10th class, right? That's all. Again, the concept of logarithms, as you will see in chapter seven, right? Sorry, chapter six, okay? And seven and eight in, in, in the course videos, right? You will encounter logarithm, using the log operation and using the two power operation a lot to solve problems okay as you see more and more problems that we see that that we have already solved in the course you will be able to appreciate using log much better okay so not a hard problem at all okay now let's go to the 10th question okay this question also i'll skip okay i'll skip this question move it to the next session okay because this also needs you to understand the concepts of uh, the concepts of order of functions right so i'm skipping this question we are making a note of all the questions that we are skipping we'll surely add it to the next session okay in case we miss it please do let us know i hope we don't miss it okay so let's go to the 11th question now okay this is fun okay let me just take a quick sip of water and we'll get started okay let's look at this question now okay so i have a function called fun right and uh, it has two values it has n and it has an array right so look at this structure this is c code my i is equal to 0 j equals to 0 okay my i is equal to 0 my j is equal to 0 this is what i'm starting with right now i have this for loop if you notice the for loop doesn't have the initialization step because i is already initialized to 0 this for loop will run as long as i is less than n and it is being incremented by one. This is the C notation. I hope all of you learned C in your BTEC first year, right? Anyway, we have a whole session on C itself, right? Once we finish data structures algorithms, we'll go back to C and delve into C in full detail, 
okay this c is very basic c nothing very complex here okay so within this for loop there is this while loop okay so within this for loop there is this while loop and this is my while loop okay we should have indented it but that's okay okay so while j is less than n and so there is this two parts j is less than n and array of i is less than array j but the problem here is we are not given what the values of array are so we don't know anything about this okay so let's assume because we want the running time complexity let's assume this is always true let's assume let 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 okay because we don't know anything about arrays if we assume it to be false this while loop will never be executed which means my overall running time would reduce so let's assume that this part of the this part of the condition is always true because we don't know the values in arr okay this array okay just to look for the worst case or the worst case running time let's assume by default that this is always true just for simplicity okay now while j is less than n j gets incremented okay so when i equals to 0 what happens let's 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 go step by step it's always important to be able to do this when i equals to 0 my j initially will be equal to 0 okay then j is less than n okay right the j will get incremented now it will become j equals to 1 j equals to 2 so on up to up to j becoming n minus 1 this loop would run right up to that time this loop would run obviously right what is the total time complexity now n times you have run this loop n times you have run this increment operator so n times now comes the fun part okay now what happens now you go to i i equals to 1 now what what at the end of this loop what is the value of j your j is equal to n at the end of these n minus 1 operations your j equals to n that's why your because your j equals to n this condition j less than n failed that's why you came out of the loop right now next is i equals to 1 okay so let me erase this so that it's easier now for me to walk you through okay so i equals to 1 now what happens to j now my j is already equal to n which means this loop would never get executed because my j is already equal to n my j is not getting reinitialized anywhere my j is not getting any reinitialized anywhere here right so j is already equal to 1 it will just check it will just make this check and it will say this is not satisfied it will not even go into the while loop so how many times did this run it ran only one time what what ran just this comparison ran we didn't go into the loop just this simple comparison of whether j is less than n or not ran that simple comparison operator ran similarly now when i equals to 2 what happens again this j is equal to n this j less than n comparison only this would run again so it would run one times right so on so forth your i as long as i is equal to n minus 1 up to i equals to n minus 1 it will keep running okay one more time now if you sum up all of this n plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 so on so forth what do you get you get order of n right so the answer here is order of n this is a i would call this a tricky question let me tell you why lot of people when they see a twin loop like this when they see a loop like this some for with while inside that the moment they see this they say oh this is n this is n so it should be order of n square okay just because you have a twin loop i call this twin loops a loop within a loop okay just because or a nested loop it's a nested loop it's also called as a nested loop with with depth of one right because you have this and you have one more loop within this loop whenever you have this right don't assume that it's going to be order of n square please run it carefully like this this question is one one sort of question which i will put it in the tricky section where many people will make silly mistakes just because they're not careful but in fact the simple comparison have one time uh, what do you okay so the question here i'm repeating it what impact would simple comparison have on time complexity okay see your time complexity if you think about if you think about time complexity right if you think about time complexity whether it's a comparison or whether it's a swap right we are assuming when we studied the basics of computational complexity we studied that this will take some constant time c1 c1 milliseconds or microseconds okay this will take c2 microseconds okay of course we, there is when we learn selection sort right when we learn selection sort there is one video where i made which shows why 
swaps are more costly than comparisons in the actual execution in the real world right when you actually write code in c or c++ or java or any language right because of the way your ram is structured because of the way your memory is structured your swap operations are slightly more expensive so your c2 is greater than c1 actually in the real world and i'll explain that and i'll motivate why selection sort is sometimes important please wait for that okay i mean of course i can't i can't i can't compress everything into one hour lecture right so we will we will cover is a very very interesting aspect that that many people don't know this this used to be one of my favorite uh, uh, interview concepts when i used to interview software engineers uh, at amazon and yahoo labs because most people don't realize so my question used to be why when when should i use a selection sort or when should i use an insertion sort many people don't know this okay why, why the heck i mean again again you'll be able to ex understand that better when we learn selection sort it all boils down to costs of swapping versus cost of comparison but for our time complex analysis right now whether it's a comparison operator or a swap operator or a simple comparison we'll assume that all of them are order of one time complexity because they're constant time right of course these constants might change but it's still from a complexity perspective it's order of one or theta of one whatever you want to use okay i hope that is clear again it's it's a, it's a good point that you raised on how how comparisons how simple comparisons are different we will compare the comparison operator or comparison operators versus swap operators when we learn selection sort okay uh where are we we are on 11th question right so let's go to the 12th question okay you are given a set of n points on a number line right okay valid so you have number line sorry I'm bad at writing this or drawing these things okay so you have a number line you are given n points okay let's call them a1 a2 a3 some number so this is a number line you are given n numbers in some arbitrary order no specific order very nice okay which means a10 could be before a2 any order right it could be any order so similarly a6 could be here any order right the task is to find the points that are closest to each other okay, this is the interesting part so you want to find points that are closest to each other which means you want to find these pairs ai aj such that ai is the closest point to aj right that's what you want to find right to solve this problem you decide to take one point and compute its distance to all the other points so i'll take one point let's say a0 i'll compute its distance to all the other points a1 a2 up to an right and repeat this process for all points now when i compute distance to all the all the remaining points that i have right let's assume i have okay let's say this is a1 because i have n points i'm trying to compare a1 with i'll do, compute the distance from a1 to a2 a3 a4 an so how many distances did i compute n minus 1 distances and amongst these distances i'll say which ai is closest to a1 and i'll say let's assume a6 is the distance from a1 to a6 is smaller than a1 to all other numbers then i'll declare a1 is closest to a6 similarly i'll repeat this to point a2 for point a2 i'll compare it with a1 i'll compare it with a3 a4 so on so forth an again how many distance comparisons i have to make n minus 1 distance comparisons right i have to compute n minus 1 distances and i have to find the minimum okay that, that's the important part n minus 1 distance computation computations plus finding the minimum i can find the minimum in of course order of n minus 1 time by just checking out which of them is the minimum so when i do this for all the n elements when i do this for all the n elements what is my total time complexity going to be sum of all of them n times which is going to be order of n square right because i have n minus 1 n minus 1 n times of course computing the minimum is also an order of n complexity so the total complexity is order of n square very simple okay straightforward problem of course they're trying to trick you by saying that these numbers lie on some number line all of those stuff that's only to trick you it's a straightforward problem okay you know you not even think of these as points lying on a number line you can think of them as numbers right think of this as real line right and all these could be numbers like 2.1 5.6 
if you have numbers like this you can sort it using your typical sorting algorithm right yeah in gate they try to confuse you certainly yes yes they would so the, the answer is order of n square obviously right so let's go to the 13th problem okay this also i'll skip unfortunately and we'll move it to the next next uh, next practice session okay because this requires understanding of order of functions but these problems are fun i really enjoy solving these problems i think some of these are problems very similar to this have been solved in the solved problem section right in um, in uh, chapter 6 in chapter 6 i think some of these problems have been tackled uh, as solved problems or something very similar to this not the exact same problem but something similar to it okay so once you finish chapter 6 solving these will become trivial because i think we have solved some uh, what eight nine problems okay we have solved eight or nine problems from previous year gates so we are trying to add as many solved problems as possible give you as many practice problems because gate is all about solving problems it's not about learning theory okay i cannot emphasize this enough okay so next let's go to the 14th question okay this is going to be fun okay so how many times would the following loop run for a given value of n okay let's look at this okay this is this is going to be a fun question okay the tricky part here is this okay let's write it down let's not worry too much about it okay so you have i equals to 2 initially then what happens to i i becomes okay you'll print some i okay then i becomes 2 into 4 i becomes 2 into 4 then what happens to i again again so this is 8 this is 8 right so next what happens this would again get multiplied by 4 so 2 into 4 square this is 4 power 1 i can write this as 4 power 0 because 4 power 0 is 1 next what happens to i 2 into 4 cube right similarly this will keep going on till the time see let's assume i am in so this is your this is your zeroth iteration this is your first iteration this is your second iteration this is your third iteration in the kth iteration what happens you, what will the value of i be your i will be 2 into 4 par k right now just like the way we have done in one of the previous problems i can write 2 into 4 power k when when this is greater than n this loop will be terminated but to solve we'll use this again logarithms to our rescue okay so let's let's look it up okay this can turn as 4 power k okay actually we can actually do this okay let me solve this okay let me just erase this let me try a simple simple idea here right so okay let's i was thinking of a different solution but let's solve it so you have this if you take log on both sides what happen one thing remember log of a into b is what log a plus log b right so if i take log on both sides this will become log 2 plus log of 4 par k right so log of 4 power k let's look at let's understand what is it so log of if i take base 2 let's assume i'm taking base 2 just for simplicity i can take any base for that matter okay so log of 4 power k right is uh, okay let's write it down okay this will be 4 into log k obviously because we have seen this log of a power b is b into log a very simple properties of log now this is equal to log n sorry 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 i think i made a mistake here this is sorry sorry i made a mistake here plus k into log 4 my my bad sorry sorry sir k into log 4 so log 2 is 1 okay so this is 1 plus k this is into 2 because log 4 base 2 is 2 because 2 power 2 is this this is equal to log n okay so now what is k i can write k as log n minus 1 by 2 which means my k is order of log n so the right answer is this see to solve this problem what did we, what did we use i think this is a problem very similar to a previous year gate question paper if i am not wrong most of the questions that we are picking either they are from previous year gate question paper some of them we have created ourselves for your practice we are taking from assignments of top universities so that so that you practice this some of these questions have been taken from exercise problems and practice problems of top university courses right like mit stanford etc right 
So all you needed to know was the basics of logarithms. You could have solved this problem trivially, right? So let's go to the 15th problem now. OK, OK, this is a good question. What is the efficient asymptotic running time to, fee, to find the median of a sorted array of size n? OK, first of all, those of you who don't know what median is, OK? As a machine learning guy, I know this very well. But anyway, so if you don't know what median is, median is the central element. Median is always called as the central element in statistics. OK? OK, anyway, we'll learn about median uh, again in data structures and algorithms itself. But let me just explain. Suppose I have these numbers 5, 7, 12, 16, and 18. This is a sorted array because it's, it said I'm given a sorted array. How many elements are there in the sorted array? First element, second element, third element, fourth element, fifth element. So the median is defined as the central element such that there are equal number of elements that are less than equal to that, and there are equal number of elements that are greater than equal to that. That's called the median. OK? The very simple idea. That's called the median. right? So here the median is 12. Right? Here the median is 12 because there are two elements to the which are less than or equal to 12, and there are two elements that are greater than or equal to 12. Notice that there are five elements here. What happens if you have six elements? Okay. So if you have even number of elements, there are two values. So let's assume I have 5, 7, 12, 13, 16, 18. Right? Now any both because there are two elements here, there are two elements here. I have to pick either this or this. When you have this type of confusion, there are many options you can take. You can either pick 12, you can pick 13, or you can pick an average of both. Okay, there are multiple options there. Okay, There is no strict definition of median here because there are two central elements. right? In general, if you are given a sorted array, if you are given a sorted array of size n, right, you can clearly say that the central element or the n by tooth element, right? You suppose this size is n, right? What have I done? n by 2. You take n by 2 and you take the seal of n by 2. Seal of n by 2 is 3 because seal of 5 by 2 is 3. Right? Seal of n by 2 will give you the median element because the array is already sorted. If the array were not sorted, then there is fun. So there is an algorithm that we'll learn a little later called the median of median algorithms. Okay, We'll learn that a little later in the course. Right? We will learn of an algorithm called median of median algorithms that given an unsorted array can find the median in order of n time. It's one of the great ideas in algorithms and data structures. Okay, I'm, I've kept it waiting because we'll, we need some more maturity of understanding of algorithms and data structures before we tackle it. This question is much more straightforward. I'm just given a sorted array. I can find the median or the central element in basically order of one time, right? Because Give, because I know the size of the array, so I can directly go, because this is an array, I can directly go to the n by 2, the seal of n by 2 element, and directly get the median without worrying about it, because the array is sorted. right? Very simple, straightforward. OK, we have solved all the problems that we have in these 15 things. I also want each of you to get acquainted with this, with this, uh, with this UI, because this is very similar. We try to replicate the UI that gate has, right? So please try and get yourself comfortable with this UI. We'll try and give all of your practice tests using this so that by the time you go for the gate exam, you're all ready, okay? So let me let me stop sharing the screen and come into the full view. Uh, we had uh, we had Subara also here uh, who was helping me from the side and we have Naveen sitting right across me uh, all this while telling me about uh, comments that students have been leaving. So yeah, so this is how we, have, we were planning to conduct some of our live sessions, wherein uh, we will solve the practice problems for you, for you. Also answer any questions, like the few questions, very good questions that our students have asked. right? So along with it, in general, in general, so we, since we have some more time, I thought uh, uh, I'll go into some more, some more details, as in, uh, so we want you to practice more and more. Please trust me. I mean, I cannot emphasize this enough. I think I'll tell you this throughout this year that however good you are with theory, if you don't practice, you don't get gate ranks. We want you to solve anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 problems by the end of the year. And I'm very confident that if you solve three to 5,000 problems on your own with the struggle and the fight, 
of course if you, if you see the answer on some forum on or on some website you will not learn because you're not building that skill of solving problems but if you put in the effort if you struggle through it if you solve 3 to 5000 problems in this year there is nothing that stops you from getting a good a single or a double or maybe a a, a low triple digit rank which will get you into good universities so yeah that's all i had for today and uh, we'll keep doing these live sessions oh by the way uh, i forgot to mention the next uh, let, let me uh, let me i wanted to tell about the next live session also let me go into the screen share okay because i wanted to show that to you okay folks uh, okay so the next live session okay so the next live session is on saturday so some of these early live sessions we are telecasting them on youtube them on youtube itself because we want other students also to learn how to prepare for gate using the methodology that we are designing and that we have built it's also a great way for us to showcase our teaching philosophy and our teaching methodology to everyone but slowly after a few sessions all of these live sessions will be limited only to our registered students like we have the again just like we we also have an ai course that some of you already know so in our ai course we have a desktop app so we have a desktop app and all of our live sessions are visible only through the desktop app they're not visible on youtube right so we will slowly we'll have a few live sessions on youtube so that everyone can benefit and learn how to prepare for gate also understand about our core philosophy right slowly we'll move it to only registered students who will be will not be able to access it on youtube will be able to access only on a desktop app we'll come to that little later right so the next live session is on saturday we'll try to make it open to all again uh, because this is this is some of the earliest live sessions it's on 23rd feb again same time 7 pm to 8:30 pm right and uh, this time what we'll do is we'll do from uh, lecture 5.6 to 6.8 let me show you what those are right okay i'll just show that to you yeah i'm going to that page so we have done it we have done till 5.5 right i wanted to do 5.6 5.7 right six the whole of sixth chapter sixth chapter is mostly solved problems okay and the reason we actually i wanted you to finish merge sort also but that's okay because we wanted to give you a saturday and sunday off to revise and write notes and all of that um uh, subarav and uh, navin said let's not overburden them right away but trust me we are starting slow right now but we will ramp up speed trust me otherwise we will not be able to finish syllabus we are just this is like the early footsteps that we are taking right so we want you to finish up to 6.8 wherein we have solved lots of problems on asymptotic analysis and all the problems that we left today okay all the problems that we left today sorry all the problems that we left out today so we'll make we'll add them into the practice session too and send you a link we'll also add new practice problems for the saturday live session and we'll send you the new practice problems the whole thing we'll send it to you by tomorrow to all the registered students right so the next live session is saturday please please don't ignore going through the videos initial since this is the initial stages we didn't want to overburden everybody we are just giving you very little content roughly like 1 hour or maybe 1 hour 15 minutes of content a day but slowly we'll speed this up to 2 hours and as time progresses even to 3 hours a day right but since this is the early few days we wanted to start slow and ramp up once we are at full throttle right so uh, next saturday see you again next saturday uh, uh, sorry the coming saturday on 23rd feb please finish from 5.6 to 6.8 we'll again send an email to all the registered students okay I'll, i'll answer that very good question yeah so yeah so practice problems all of this stuff so here is a good question that uh, uh, that subarav just mentioned right now so let's solve it the question here is imagine i have insertion sort right let's assume my items are already in sorted order let's say 2 4 6 8 10 right so items are already sorted they are already in sorted order okay because we have seen a few examples where they are not in sorted order or in reverse sorted order if they are already in sorted order what is the time complexity we actually discussed this in the course videos right so i start here let's let's just solve this problem this is not rocket science right i start here this is trivially sorted next i go to the fourth element i i go to the second element sorry i go to the second element i compare the second element with the first element 
this is already greater so there is nothing to worry how many comparisons I have done i have done only one comparison and no swaps right next i have two and four which is sorted now i compare six with four six is already greater so i've done one more comparison right there are no swaps nothing so this is sorted now now i'll start with eight i'll compare eight with six eight is already greater nothing to do so i've done one more comparison similarly now this whole thing is sorted so on so forth so in this case if it is already sorted we will simply have order of n comparisons and no sorts uh, no swaps okay zero swaps so we'll have zero swaps okay or you can write this as order of one swaps because zero is also a constant right so in the best case this is the best case of insertion sort we actually discussed this in one of in some of the videos but uh, so Baro just asked me to recap this just in case some but some of you have forgotten it okay sounds good just give me a second let me stop the screen share Okay, folks. Uh, yeah. Thank you again for joining us uh, and uh, see you on Saturday. Bye-bye. Take care.